All praises to the most High God. So tonight's topic, we are continuing on the series, the state, the seven stages of being born again, or the seven stages of repentance. So we're going to be dealing with the last uh, pillar, which is nation-minded, nation-building. We're going to be dealing with that, dealing with your nation, being about your nation, okay? Let's open up with the book of Titus, okay? Titus 2 verse 1. Titus chapter 2 verse 1. Let's start there. Titus chapter 2 verse 1. Come on. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Come on. Read that again. Titus chapter 2 verse 1. Go ahead. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Now this is a commandment. It says speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Because the only way for us to speak the things that become sound doctrine, we must be taught the sound doctrine of the Mosai. Okay? Get that in Proverbs. Okay? Proverbs 4 verse 2. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 2. Let's see the sound doctrine that the Lord has taught us. The sound doctrine that the Lord has bestowed upon his sons and daughters. Read what you got. Proverbs 4 verse 2. Read that. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 2. You know what? Start of verse 1. Proverbs 4 verse 1, read. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 1. Come on. Hear ye children, the instruction of a father, and mm -hmm. attend to no understanding. You see that? He says, hear ye children, the instruction of a father, and attend to no understanding. Go ahead. For I give you good doctrine, forsake you not my law. You see what the Lord is saying? He says, because I give you good doctrine. The sound doctrine, which is the good doctrine, the Lord is the one that gave us the doctrine, which is what? Not forsaking his laws, keeping his commandments. That's the sound doctrine. Okay, get that in Sirach 19, verse 19. Ecclesiasticus chapter 19, verse 19. Let's deal, we're still dealing with the doctrine. The sound doctrine that the Lord has given unto us, which we must speak this day. Okay, read that. Sirach 19, verse 19. Ecclesiasticus chapter 19, verse 19. Go ahead. The knowledge of the commandments of the Lord is the doctrine of life. You see that? The knowledge, the knowledge of God's commandments is the doctrine of life. Because the knowledge of God's commandments, when you have to apply it in order for you to have that knowledge, you must apply it. You understand? It's taught to you, you apply it. That's the doctrine of life. You understand? Go ahead. And they that do things that please him shall receive the fruit of the tree of immortality. You see that? We're going to receive everlasting life when we have the knowledge of the commandment of the Lord, which is the sound doctrine in Proverbs 4 verse 2. The sound doctrine in Titus 2 verse 1. Okay? So now that we have the sound doctrine, we understand what the sound doctrine is. It says, speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Give me that in Ecclesiasticus. Okay? Sirach chapter 9. Sirach 9, verse 15. Read that. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 9, verse 15. Go ahead. Let thy talk be with the wise, mm -hmm. and all thy communication in the law of the Most High. You see that? He says, let your talk be with the wise. Who is the wise? Get that in Psalms, okay? Give me Psalms 19, verse 7. Let's see who is the wise, okay? He says, let your talk be with the wise. Who is the wise? Read that. Psalm chapter 19, verse 7. Mm -hmm. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Come on. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You see that? The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So the testimony, the laws of God, they are perfect. There's nothing wrong with God's commandments. They convert the soul, meaning they transform your mind. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Why is he saying the testimony of the Lord is sure? Watch this. Give me that in Psalms 132 verse 11. The testimony of the Lord that is sure. Okay. Psalms 132 verse 11. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Read that. Psalm chapter 132 verse 11. The Lord had sworn in truth unto David. 
he will not turn from it. Of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. You see what he's saying? Yo, your, your, your mic is quite low. Can you put the volume up? Are you able yes, to sir. do that? Yes, sir. Okay, read that again, verse 11. Psalm chapter 132, verse 11. The Lord has sworn in truth unto David. He will not turn from it. Of the mm -hmm. fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. You see what he's saying? It says, it says, the Lord has sown, hath sown in truth unto David. When the Lord, when the most high God makes a promise, he never breaks those promises. You understand? He says, he will not turn from that promise. He says, of the fruit of thy body will I set upon thy throne. With the fruit of David's body, that is sperm. So Christ will come out of the lineage of David. Okay, come on. If thy children will keep my covenant, and mm -hmm. my testimony, there I shall teach them. Right. Their children shall also sit upon thy throne forevermore. You see what he's saying? He says, if thy children will keep my covenant, okay, and my testimony that I shall teach them, their children shall also sit upon the throne, thy throne forevermore. He's talking about us, the 12 tribes of Israel. So what we, what we just read, okay, when it says, a sure foundation, okay? What is he talking about? He's talking about what? He's talking about the testimonies of Christ because Christ's testimony is, is the reason why we, we, are, we, are, we are alive this day. You understand? Because, watch this. Give me the book of Hebrews real quick, okay? Give me Hebrews 9. Christ's testimony is the, is the only way we are going to overcome. Not our testimony because our testimony is not sure like we read in the book of Psalms 19, verse 7. He says, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. Watch this. Give me Hebrews 9, okay? Hebrews chapter 9 and verse... Read verse 16. Hebrews 9, verse 16. Watch this. You know what? Start at verse 15. We're going to read down, okay? You know what? Let's start at verse 14. Hebrews 9, verse 14. We're going to read down. Go ahead. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14. Come on. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God? Go ahead. Patch your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. You see that thing? It says what? It says, how much more shall the blood of Christ, because the blood of Christ is the only way we are going to overcome in these last days, the blood of Christ, the sacrifice that he made. He says, he offered himself without spot to God. Purge our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Because why? Our minds was corrupt. Our conscience was messed up. You understand? Go ahead. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament. Of the New Covenant. Of the New Covenant. He says, if my children, will, will their children will keep my covenant and my testimony. That's what we read in Psalms 132, verse 11 down. Go ahead. That by means of death, mm -hmm. for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. So Christ is the mediator of the New Testament because Moses was the mediator of the old. Christ is the mediator of the New Testament. So now here what we're reading is says, he says, what? He says, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament. He's letting you know the people that were under the first covenant, the first testament is the 12 tribes. Likewise, the people under the new covenant is the 12 tribes. That hasn't changed. Okay, go ahead. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. That's why it says the testimony of the Lord is sure. It says, for where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. Meaning in order for your, your testimony to be sure, to stand sure, you have to die. You understand? Like Christ did. You see that thing? Go ahead. That's why it says his testimony, not ours, but his. Right? For a testament is of force after men are dead. You see that? 
is as for a testament is a force after men are dead, meaning it stands sure. The testimony of the Lord is sure because Christ died and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. So here it says, for a testament is a force, is of force after men are dead. Christ did that thing. Go ahead. Otherwise, it is of no strength at all while the testator liveth. Because he can change his mind. She can change her mind and says to a hell with you and this truth, I'm out. I'm going back to the world. I want to I want to put pens on. I want to smoke weed. Guess what? You see that? So you cannot put your trust upon the testimony of somebody else. You must put your trust upon the testimony of Christ, his testimony. You understand? That's why it says the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So go back to Psalms 19 verse 7. Let's go back there. Psalm chapter 19, verse 7. Go ahead. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting mm. the soul. Right. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. You see that? The testimony of the Lord is sure. It's a sure foundation. It's sure testimony, making wise the simple. You understand? So now, what we, what we read earlier, okay? Watch this. Now go back to um, go back to Titus, okay? Go back to Titus. Let's go back there to Titus. Titus, okay, Titus chapter two, two verse one. Titus chapter Come two on. verse one. Go ahead. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Mm -hmm. That the aged man. Hold on, read that part again. Speak what? Titus chapter 2, verse 1. Mm -hmm. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. He says, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Remember what we read in, in, in Ecclesiasticus. Go back there. Before I go back to Titus, go back to Sirach 9, verse 15. Let's go back there so we catch the thought. Sirach chapter 9, verse 15. Read that again for me. Ecclesiasticus chapter 9, verse 15. Go ahead. Let thy talk be with the wise mm -hmm. and all thy communication in the law of the most high. You see that? He says, let thy talk be with the wise. Let thy talk be with the wise. Remember what we read in Titus. Okay, he says, but speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Then the only way for you to speak the things that become sound doctrine, your what? He says what? Your talk must be with the wise. Who's the wise? Is those that keep God's commandments. Those that are repenting. You understand? Those are mindful of God's laws. Those that use the laws of God to make day-to-day -day decisions. Those that, are, that, that use the power of God's commandments to bring change to their life. So that's why it says, let your talk be with the wise and all thy communication in the law of the Mosa. You see that thing? So this doctrine, go back to Titus now. Two verse one. Now we understand who's the wise. You understand the wise that under the wise is those that understand that the testimony of the Lord is sure. You understand? Read that. Titus two verse one. Titus chapter two verse one. Go ahead. But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. This is a commandment. Is a speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. Okay, go ahead. That the aged man be sober, mm -hmm. brave, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. So now remember what we're going over. Remember the, the, the last pillar of the seven stages of repentance is what? Nation building. You understand? Being about your nation. So in order for you to be about your nation, you know, the most High God deals with the man first. Get that in uh, Proverbs chapter 8 verse 4. Proverbs 8 verse 4, the Lord deals with the man. So in Titus 2, we're going to go over the pillars of nation building. You understand? In Titus 2 covers nation building on the man's side, on the young men, on the women's side, on in the young women. It covers everybody. Okay? Now read that. Proverbs chapter 8 verse 4. Come on. 
Proverbs chapter 8, verse 4. Read. And to you, O men, I call. Mm -hmm. And my voice is to the sons of men. You see what he's saying? And to you, O men, I call. My voice is to the sons of men. So guess what? The most High God is calling the men first, the leaders of the nation the men that will be able to deal with the issues of the community, young men going around stealing, breaking into people's houses, guess what? Our job is to deal with that. You understand? Young girls having sex, drinking, popping babies, having abortion, catching STDs. Our job is to deal with those matters that, that, that concern our nation. That's our job. We do it with boldness, without fear. The most High God has come, he's given us the power to do so. You understand? Now, Let's go back. Titus 2, verse 2 again. Titus chapter 2, verse 2. Read. That the aged men be sober, mm -hmm. great, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. So the aged man, he says, we must be sober. We must not be drunks. He says, you understand? We must be grave. We must be serious. Temperate. Okay? We must be serious. Sound in faith when it comes to God's laws. You understand? In charity, in patience. That's the requirement, right? Let's get some more details on this. This is the requirement for the aged men because the aged men, they set the example for the young men that come after them. Watch this. Give me the book of 1 Timothy 3 verse 1. 1 Timothy, okay? 1 Timothy 3 and verse 1. Watch this. Read that. Come on. 1 Timothy chapter 3. Three verse one. Go ahead. This is a true saying. Mm -hmm. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. You see that is if you desire the office of a bishop, a bishop is a what? A bishop just means leader. Okay. If a man desire the position of leadership, he says you are desiring a good work because your the your your office is going to what? Your office will be to build the nation. And you're not going to use your emotion to build the nation. You're going to use God's laws, his sound doctrine, like we read in Titus 2 verse 1. Go ahead. A bishop then must be blameless. Mm -hmm. The husband of one wife, vigilant, mm -hmm. sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. You see that? It, it says a bishop must be blameless, okay? Meaning keep God's laws above, you know, above, above reproach. You must be doing that. It says husband of one wife, vigilant. You understand? Miss me was me a watchman, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. Meaning what? You must have the aptitude to teach your nation. Go ahead. Not given to wine, Mm -hmm. No striker, you see not that? greedy. Is not hold on, not given to wine. No striker, meaning what? Don't like to fight. Read. Not greedy or filthy lucre. You know, you understand. Don't be greedy. Go ahead. But patient. Mm -hmm. Not a brawler. Not covetous. You see that he says you must be patient. Not a brawler. Not covetous. These are the characteristics of good stewardship. Good leadership. Okay, go ahead. One that ruleth well his own house. Stop right there. He says, one that ruleth well his own house. One that ruleth well his own house. And how do we rule the houses? We rule our houses with God's laws. That's why it says, one that ruleth well his own house. Meaning his house is in order. Go ahead. Having his children in subjection with all gravity. You see that? Having his children in subjection with all gravity. Because why? Remember, this, the sixth pillar was what? Was dealing with the family. You understand? Making sure that you as the man, you are in order, the wife in order, the children in order. Guess what? Because now you are, you, are, you are proving to find a wife, a spouse that you're going to build the family with, which is what? Which, which is a foundation for building that strong nation. So now here says, once you are married with the wife and so forth, now the children come. That's your nation. That's the nation right there. Begins in your house. That's why he says, read that again. Verse 4. First Timothy chapter 3 verse 4. Mm -hmm. One that ruleth well his own house. Go ahead. 
having his children in subjection with all gravity. You see that? So in order for you to get to this stage, that means you have your wife in subjection to God's commandments in terms of her role to submit to you. You have also, you understand God's commandments, you submit to Christ. Okay, come on. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, mm -hmm. how shall he take care of the church of God? You see that thing? Because if you cannot do verse 4, you will not be able to do verse 5. Because verse 4 says, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. Verse 5 is letting you says, listen, because if you cannot apply verse 4, you're not going to be able to take care of the church of God. The church of God is your house, your wife and your children. That's your church. That's why in verse 5, it's, in, it's in actually is being emphasized here. It says, how shall he be able to take care of the church of God? Because your church begins in your house. That's your wife. That's your children. Then once you have those in subjection, once you have those in order, guess what? You'll be able to teach the nation of Israel. That's what the Lord is teaching us right there. Okay, come on. Not a novice. You see that? Not a novice. Okay. Without experience. Go ahead. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. We don't want that. That's why we have to do things in order. We, have, we must be patient. We don't hand over a position like we're handing out bananas and so forth. Mm -mm. It's going to take time. Why? Because we need to make sure that we have a solid foundation in Christ. Okay, read on. Moreover, he must have a good report. You see that? Them you must have a, hold on. He says, moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without. Meaning the people that used to know you in the world, they used to know you as that nigga that used to lie, cheat and steal and do all these evil things. Now that you come into the truth, now they see you in a different light. They don't see you as that nigga no more. They see the way you conduct yourself and say, wait a minute, I used to know this brother. He used to do X, Y, and Z, but now he's a completely new man. That's what he's going into. Go ahead. Lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Read. Okay, that's it on there. That's it on there. That's it on there. Now, keep reading. Okay, because this goes into the leadership. It starts with the top leadership, which is the bishop. Go ahead. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 8. Come on. Likewise, must the deacons be great, mm -hmm. not double tongued, not given too much wine, not greedy or filthy, filthy lucre. You see that the deacons, they are the assistants to the bishop. It says, likewise, must the deacons be great, meaning they must be serious, like we read in Titus. So this is giving more details than what we read in Titus 2, verse 1 and 2 regarding the age man. He is giving you more details. Okay, come on. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. You see that? Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. The mystery of the faith. Give me that in First Corinthians, okay? Give me First Corinthians real quick. Give me First Corinthians chapter 4. First Corinthians 4 verse 1. Read that. First Corinthians chapter four, verse one. Read. Really? Let a man so account of us. He says, let a man, hold on. He says, let a man so account of us. What does he mean? This is how men should look at us. That's what he's saying. Go ahead. As of the ministers of Christ. As the what? As of the ministers of Christ. Because we are the ministers of Jesus the Christ. Go ahead. And stewards of the mysteries of God. And what? And stewards of the mysteries of God. And stewards of the mysteries of God. Because we are all stewards in here. You understand? Stewardship. Being responsible for a position, a nation, a task. That's stewardship. So the Lord is telling us, it says what? It says, and we are stewards of the mysteries of God. Go ahead. The bishops, the deacons. You understand? Go ahead. Moreover, it is required in stewards that a it man be found faithful. It is required in stewards. It is required in stewards. So that's a law. That's a commandment. That's a requirement right there. It is required in stewards that what? 
that a man be found faithful. That a man be found faithful. We must be found faithful when it comes to what? Dealing with God's people and dealing with God's laws. Because the nation of Israel is God's nation. Okay, watch this. Give me that in 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 23 and verse 3. Watch this. Second Samuel, chapter 23, verse 3. Read. The God of Israel said, the rock of Israel spake to me. Mm -hmm. He that ruleth over men must be just, Go ahead. ruling in the fear of God. You see what he's saying? He says, he that ruleth over men must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Give me that in Ezekiel 18, verse 4. Okay, Ezekiel 18, verse 4. He says, he that ruleth over men must be what? Must be just, ruling in the fear of God. Ezekiel 18, verse 5. Read that. Ezekiel, chapter 18, verse 5. Come on. But if a man be just and do that which is lawful and right. You see that? So a just man will do that which is lawful and right in the sight of the law. Okay? So let's go back now. First Timothy 3. First Timothy chapter 3, read verse 9 again. First Timothy chapter 3, verse 9. Mm -hmm. Holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. In a pure conscience, meaning your conscience is clear. You understand? Your conscience is purged from all sins, like we read in what? In Hebrews 9, verse 14. Go ahead. And let these also first be proved. And let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. You see what he's saying? He says, let, also, he says, let these also first be proved. How are you going to be proved? We have to put you, the, the Lord has to what? The most High God is going to use men on earth to put you through uh, uh, tests to see how you conduct yourself and so forth. He says, you must be proved. We're going to prove you with God's laws. You're going to be tried with the spirit of the Lord. You understand? That's why it says they must be first be proved. Then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. So you will not be you will not be able to use the, that, that office if you have not been proved first yet. That's what the Lord is teaching us. That. Then he says after they are proved, then let them use the office of a deacon being found blameless. So that means you have to be washed. We have to talk about you when we're discussing um, the brothers that are upcoming. We have to discuss you. We have to talk about you. You understand? How is this brother? How is that brother? You understand? How is this brother? How is his mind? How is he conducting himself? You understand? So we can be able to gauge what type of, um, what type of leader you are going to become in years to come. You understand? So that's what you need to understand. It's not going to happen without you being talked about. We're going to talk about you. Don't get it twisted. Okay, why? Because we have you have to be proved. You are going to be over God's heritage, understand? So that's not a small task, not a small job, okay? It's not anything to play with. Is it mean you're not going to make mistakes? Of course you will. But the key is recover quickly, and guess what? You learn from them. That's the point. Now, what's this? Um, jump down to verse 12, okay? First Timothy 3, verse 12, read that. First Timothy. Chapter 3, verse 12. Go ahead. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, mm -hmm. ruling their children and their own houses well. You see that? The same thing that the, the same requirement for the bishop is the same requirement for who? The same require, requirement for the deacons as well. Go ahead. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good decree. Mm -hmm. and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. You see that thing? It says, for they that have used the office of a deacon well purchased to themselves a good degree. Because that is a, that is a good degree. Don't worry about Esau's degrees and all that. Oh, by the way, I'm not saying don't, don't study. Mm -mm. I'm not saying don't, don't push your career so you can be able to have a skill. I'm not saying that. The degree that we are talking about that the Lord is explaining is what? understanding God's commandments 
and understanding the wisdom that the Lord has in this book through his laws. So you can be able to teach the nation of Israel. That's what he's going into there. You understand? So that's why it says, and great boldness in the faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Great boldness in the faith. Not great boldness in terms of Sasha fears. Mm -mm. Great boldness in the faith. You understand? Now, watch this. I'm going to give an example, right? Regarding the aged men, their conduct, their behavior. You understand? Watch this. Give me second Mark up is 6, verse 18. This is our forefather Eliezer, okay? Because the job of the aged man is to set the right example for the young men that are coming behind them. Watch this. Second Maccabees chapter 6, verse 18. Come on. Second Maccabees chapter 6, verse 18. Right? Eliezer, one of the principal scribes, an aged mm -hmm. man, and of a well-favored countenance, was constrained to open his mouth and to eat swine's flesh. So this is during the time of the Greeks. So it says, our forefather Eliezer, he said, was an aged man and well favored. So he says, was constrained, meaning he was forced to open his mouth and to eat swine's flesh, which he refused, of course, all praises. Okay, jump down to verse 21. Second Maccabees, chapter six, verse 21. Go ahead. But they that had the charge of that wicked feast, Mm -hmm. For the old acquaintance they had with the man, taking him aside, besought him to bring flesh of his own provision, right. such as was lawful for him to use, and make as if he did eat of the flesh taken from the sacrifice commanded by the king. This is during the time of Antiochus the fourth. So now it says those that the old his old the old acquaintances of our forefather Eliezer. Because they had made a league with King Antiochus, you understand? So now they push it, they put, they pull him to the side and say, listen, just make it as though you are eating swine's flesh, but you're going to eat out of your own provision. You're going to eat lawful meat, but we're going to make it seem like it's actually the swine's flesh that Antiochus and us want you to eat so that we don't find ourselves into some troubles. So they were scared, you understand? So they said, no, just make it as though you're eating it. You understand? Watch this. Hold that. Give me that in. Uh, uh, give me that in uh, First Thessalonians. Is it Thessalonians chapter five? Okay. Let's read that. First Thessalonians chapter five and verse twenty-two. Read that. First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse twenty-two. Go ahead. Abstain from all appearance of evil. You see what the Bible is saying? It says, abstain from all appearance of evil. So what we're reading here is that that's exactly what our forefather Eliezer was alluding to. That, listen, I'm going to abstain from all appearance of evil. Yes, it may seem like I'm eating pork, but I'm not. But it looked like I am because that was the subject. You understand? Being forced to eat swine's flesh which is unlawful for us to eat. Okay, go back to Second Maccabees now. Six, read verse twenty-two now. Second Maccabees chapter six, verse twenty-two. Go ahead. That in so doing he might be delivered from death, mm -hmm. and for the old friendship with them find favor. You see that he says in that. So the reason why they are commanding him to do so is so that what he can be what he can be delivered from death and for the old friendship with them and find, find favor. So this is what, just so that he can be spared, so he can be a coward and so forth in his old age. Keep reading, verse 23, read. But he began to consider discreetly and as became his age and the excellency of his ancient years Come on. and the honor of his gray, of his gray head, whereunto he was come and his most honest education from a child, or rather the holy law made and given by God. Mm -hmm. Therefore, he answered accordingly and willed them straight ways to send him to the grave. He says, you rather put me to death because he began to what? He says he began to consider discreetly, meaning in his mind to say, wait a minute, if I do this, how is this going to look down the line in the future? You understand? So he's like, no, nah, I'm not doing that. 
because I'm going to stain, I'm going to put a stain on my name. He says, and it's become his age because he's also considering his age, the excellency of his, of his ancient years. You see that? The honor of his gray hair, of his gray hair. So he's thinking about all of that. And he says, wait until he was come and his most honest education from a child. So he's been pushing this from a child. You understand? He continued with that, with the things that he was taught. He didn't let them go. He didn't push them to the side. He didn't cast them behind his back. He pushed them until he was an aged man. You understand? Read on, verse 24. For it becometh not our age, said he, in any wise to dissemble, whereby many young persons might think that Eliezer, being fourscore years old and ten, were now gone to a strange religion. You see what he's saying? He is thinking about the young man that is coming behind him. He said, wait a minute. If I do this, what type of message is, it go is this going to send to the young man that will come after me in the last days? You understand? After I'm gone, during his time and in these last days. You understand? So he's thinking about that. Or no, this is, I need to set the right example. That's what he's saying. Go ahead. And so they threw mine hypocrisy and desire to live a little time and a moment longer should be deceived by me. Mm -hmm. And I get a stain to my old age and make it abominable. You see what he was thinking, he says, and, and so they, meaning the young men in verse 24, through my hypocrisy and desire to live a little time and a moment longer, meaning what? They also will follow that poor example, say, I also want to live, I want to spare my life. I would rather break God's commandments so I can spare my life. You understand? He said, no, I'm not doing that. Okay, because I'm going to put a stain to my old age. Read on. For though for the present time I should be delivered from the punishment of men, mm -hmm. yet should I not escape the hand of the Almighty, neither alive nor dead. You see what he's saying? He says, yes, I will escape the, punish but the punishment of men. But he says, yet, I'm not going to escape the hand of the Almighty, neither alive nor dead. So he's thinking about this. Mm -mm, I fear the Lord. So I'm going to do what the Bible says. Go ahead. Wherefore now, manfully changing this life, I will show myself such a one as my age requires. He says, I'm going to behave myself according to as my age requires. What is he saying? Experience. He says, based on my, the experience that I have as an aged man, Listen, I'm not going to make this decision because I'm afraid. Read on. And leave a notable example to such as be young to die willingly and courageously for the honorable and holy laws. Mm -hmm. And when he had said these words, immediately he went to the torment. He says, immediately he went to the torment. He said, okay, you can put me to death because I don't want to eat pork. But I'm not going to make it seem like I'm eating it so that I can put a stain on my name and also destroy those that come behind. That's what he was saying. So that's the mindset when you did that because our forefather Eliezer, he wasn't just thinking about himself. He was thinking about the nation. So he was nation-minded. He loved his nation and that's how he thought. That was his mindset. Every decision he made, he considered his nation. That how is the nation going to look? How is the nation going to be down the line based on the decision that I'm making right now? How is it going to affect the nation in times to come? He thought about that. So when you're thinking about now that you have a family, you get yourself a wife and so forth, you build a family, that's the same thing that you must do. You understand? You must have, you must be like that when it comes to your wife and your children. Guess what? When it comes to the congregation, you're going to do the same thing. You understand? You must think about your family. Yeah, according to God's commandment, not according to worldly, the way the world says, but according to God's laws. Okay, now let's go back. Let's go back to Titus. Okay, Titus 2. Titus 2 and verse 2 again. Titus chapter 2, verse 2. Go ahead. That the aged man be sober, great, mm -hmm. temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. You see that? So he says, he must, the aged man must be sober. So our forefather Eliezer, he was sober. He was grave. He was temperate. He was sound in faith, meaning he had sense in charity, in patience. 
because he loved these people. He loved the nation. You understand? So when, as a brother, as a man, you understand? In this truth, your mind is about the nation. You understand? And guess what? When it comes to your nation, your wife must support the vision that the Lord has put in your spirit to build your nation up. Your wife must support you. You understand? She, was, she must be the number one supporter of this truth and support you, you understand, by supporting this truth, to support this truth by supporting you, being that pillar of rest. You understand? So on and so forth. Because if you have a wife that is encouraging you, that is, is, is rooting for you to push this truth and all of that, you have a revolutionary wife. You understand? So when you go out there, you will definitely be able to fight the good fight of faith. Why? Because you have support. You understand? Now watch this. Give me, let's go to Titus 2 verse 3. Now let's deal with the women. Okay? Read verse 3. Come on. Titus 2 verse 3. Read. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as become as holiness. Mm -hmm. Not false accusers, not given too much wine. Teachers of good things. You see that thing? The aged women likewise, this likewise as the aged men in verse 2, is that they must be in behavior as becometh holiness. Not false accusers, meaning don't gossip, backstep, double tongue, okay? Not given too much wine, meaning they must be not be drunks like we see, unlike we see them today. Like we see them today, our sisters be getting drunk. They drink more than the men do now. They even smoke more than them, okay? It says, not given too much wine, teachers of good things. So they must be teachers of the law. That's the good things. You understand? They must not be teaching young girls how to twerk. They must not be teaching young girls how to get a boyfriend, how to get a sugar daddy. You understand? They must not be doing that. How to get, how to extract money from a man. Because that's what a lot of these, our sisters, that's what they do. So that's how they teach the young women. But they're not teaching them the right way. They are, not, they are not teaching by their um, righteous example. They are teaching by their poor example. Okay, watch this. Give me 1 Timothy 3, verse 11. Okay, let's deal with the wives. Because here it says, the wives, the aged women, okay, which the aged women, they must be in behavior. Okay, 1 Timothy 3, verse 11. Watch this. Come on. 1 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 11. Wait. Right? Even so, must their wives be great, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. You see that thing? So in Titus is giving you more details. Here what we're reading here is talking about the wives that are what, that they are. Remember it says, a bishop must be a husband of one wife. A deacon must be a husband of one wife. So these wives, the wives of the leadership and so forth, of the men of Israel waking up the nation, it says they also must be what must be great. They must be serious, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things. So their mindset must mirror the mindset of the men that go out to war, the men that the Lord has ordained to wake up and lead the nation and teach the nation. So these are revolutionary women right here. You understand? This, these, this bunch, these are revolutionary women. Okay, watch this. Give me Sarah 26, 14, because in order for them to be what? Grave, not slanderous, sober, faithful in all things is because of this. Because these women, they are what? They are taught by men. They are taught by their husbands or they are taught by their leadership if they are not married. Okay, watch this. Sarah 26, 14. Read there. Ecclesiastes chapter 26, verse 14. Go ahead. A silent and loving woman is the gift of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And there is nothing so much worth as a mind well instructed. You see what the Bible is saying? A silent and loving woman. He says that's a gift of the Lord. There is nothing so much worth as a mind well instructed. Because who's instructed this mind well? The leadership. You understand? The husband. The father. You understand? So the father, the husband, the leadership, they are the ones that are making sure that this woman's mind is well instructed according to God's laws. Instructed to be what? Instructed to be sober, to be vigilant, to be sound in faith. So their mind will be according to the mind of the leadership, the husband or the father. 
That's what the Bible is saying right there. Okay, keep reading. Verse 15, go ahead. A shame faith and faithful woman is a double grace. Mm -hmm. And a continent mind cannot be valued. And a disciplined mind cannot be valued. Meaning you can't put a price on that. Why? Because this mind is well instructed. This woman right there, she's a Proverbs 31. She's a revolutionary sister. You understand? Because she's in complete submission to her husband, to her man, to the leadership, to her father. Why? Because she understands that because I need a hedge over. If I'm not, I'm going to be spoiled. My mindset is going to be corrupt. The way I think, the way I speak, the way I dress, who I deal with, who I interact with, and how do I interact with them, how I eat and all that. All of that is going to be spoiled because I don't have a hedge over. That's what the Lord is teaching us right there. So a revolutionary sister is a sister that is in complete submission because she understands where the power comes from. You understand? In submission. Watch this. Give me the book of 1 Corinthians 14. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 14. We're still dealing with the women, the aged women. These aged women, they are instructed of the men. Okay, that's why they are, then later on, they'll be able to know how to deal with the young, the young, the young children, the young, the young women, because in order for them to know that, they've got kids themselves. So they know how to deal with the newborns. They know how to deal with pregnancy. They know how to deal with toddlers. They know how to deal with teenagers. You see that? So they know, they know how to cover that whole spectrum from the time a woman is pregnant until the child is born, they are a toddler, they are a teenager. You see that thing? That's what he's going into. Okay, First Corinthians 14. And who's going to be teaching you all this? The leadership, the man, the husband, the father, and so forth. First Corinthians 14 and verse, read verse 34 and 35 together. Okay, come on. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 34. Right. Let your women keep silence in the churches. Mm -hmm. For it is not permitted unto them to speak. Right. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also says the Lord. You see that thing? They are commanded to be under obedience, as also said the law. Because the law that they are commanded to be under obedience of to is this law right here. Get that in Genesis 3.16? This is the law that the Apostle Paul is making reference to. Okay, read that. Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. Come on. And to the women, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Mm -hmm. In sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. You see what he's saying? He says, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. That goes into what the child labor pains. That goes into the menstrual cramps that they get every month as a reminder of their disobedience. Okay, so then it says, in sorrow, thou shalt bring forth children and thy desire shall be to thy husband and he, your husband shall rule over thee. Because your husband, your desire to learn, your desire to learn anything, to know everything, you must go to your husband. You're not married, you go to the leadership or your father. Why? Because you must be in subjection unto a man. You understand? From your father's house, you go to your husband's house. That's the order. So now what we're reading here is the law that it must be under is what? They must understand that the husband is the head. And they must submit themselves to the husband because that's their head. That's their law. Okay? Now watch this. A woman that does that, guess what? And a woman that understands that, Here's what's going to happen. Get Proverbs 14 verse 1. This is the type of mindset that she will have. She will have this type of mindset. Whatever she does, she will always keep this in mind. Read that. Proverbs 14 verse 1. Come on. Proverbs chapter 14 verse 1. Mm -hmm. Every wise woman builds her house. Mm -hmm. But the foolish plucketh it down with her hands. You see that? He says, every wise woman buildeth her house. The woman, the reason why this woman is wise is because her mind is well instructed by who? Her husband, the leadership, her father. So it says, every wise woman buildeth her house. She's going to build her house. She will support 
the men. She will support the troops. You understand? That's what she'll do because she understands that they are the ones that are laying the foundation. Our job is to is to what is to build on this foundation by what by following instruction and instructing others by our righteous example. For who, for instance, the children, the young women, you understand how to take care of the house and so forth. That's the job that a wise woman will do that. You understand? But it's, but the foolish placate it down with their hands. Let me show you how she does it. Give me the book of Sarah 25, verse 23. Let me show you how the foolish plucks the house down. Sarah 25, 23, read that. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 25, verse 23. Read. A wicked woman abateth the courage. Abateth Make the it. courage. A, a wicked woman abated the courage. Meaning a wicked woman will what? Will destroy a man's courage to go out there to build and teach and lead the nation. A wicked woman will do that because why? A wicked woman will not want the men to go out to war and wake up Israel. A wicked woman is not nation-minded. She's only thinking about herself. She don't care about the nation. That's a wicked woman. That's not a wise woman. You understand? She obeys the courage. That's how she plugs the house down. Okay, go ahead. A wicked woman abated the courage, made Wait. a heavy countenance and a wounded heart. You see that thing? Is that she what? She maketh a heavy countenance because why? She going to make you sick. You understand? And it says a wounded heart. She going to give you problems, stress. Why? Because the, she what? She's destroying a man's courage to go out there and build. You understand? So when you brothers, you are proving, you need to be able to understand, to know if this woman is about the nation. She's about nation building. Because if she's not about nation building, once you get married, she's going to give you problems when it comes to what? Dealing with the men, dealing with where we need to go when we go out to war and so on and so forth. She's going to give you problems. So you need to be able to know beforehand during the proving process if she's going to interfere with that or she will support you 100%. You need to know that. You understand? There is no way our forefathers was able to go out there to war with this nation, to conquer the land of Canaan. You understand? The Amorite kings during the time of Joshua. You understand? So on and so forth. How were they able to do that? Because guess what? They had righteous women at, at the house. They, has, they had wise women that built their houses. They supported them. That's the point. Okay, Ray? A woman that will not comfort her husband in distress maketh weak hands and feeble knees. You see that thing? It says a woman that will not comfort her husband in distress. Are we not in distress right now? Yes, we are. Because the nations, all the nations are against us. All the nations are fighting against us. All the nations don't want us to rise up. And because of that, it says a wicked woman is as a woman that will not comfort her husband in distress, maketh weak hands and feeble knees. Meaning what? Discouragement. She'll give you problems. She will stress you out. Why? Because that's not a wise woman. You understand? That's a demon. That's not a wise woman. That's how she plugs the house down. He don't consider that we are at war and we need to go out and fight for our nation. Okay, now go back. Okay, go back to, um, now give me Titus chapter three, chapter two, verse four now. Titus two, verse four. Let's go back. Titus, I was just giving you an example of what we read in Titus two and verse three regarding the aged women. You know what? Hmm. I'm going to give some examples, right? Watch this. Something just popped into my head. It's not part of my nose, but I'll use it. Get Genesis 14. I'm going to show you something with this. It says, read that again. Sarah, okay, Sarah 25. Sarah 25 is 23. Read that again. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 25, verse 23. Mm -hmm. A wicked woman abated the courage, maketh right? a heavy countenance and a wounded heart. Mm -hmm. A woman that will not comfort her husband in distress maketh weak hands and feeble knees. So now I'm going to give an example. So imagine if our forefather Abraham 
our four, imagine if our foremother Sarah was giving our forefather Abraham problems like we're reading here, like this type of woman. Listen, this was not going to happen. This wasn't going to happen. I'm going to give an example. But because our foremother Sarah supported her husband, you know what? Let's paint the picture. Get that in um, Genesis. Get Genesis 18. Get Genesis 18 verse 12. Because I want to show you that our foremother Sarah, she supported and reverenced our forefather Abraham. And watch this. Genesis 18 verse 12. Genesis chapter 18, verse 12. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am west old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? My Lord being old also? My Lord, my Lord, my Lord being old also. You see how she's, you see how she's calling our forefather Abraham? She's not calling our forefather Abraham by his first name. Like you see our sisters are doing today. They say they are married, but they call their, their husbands by their first name. Just disrespectful as hell. But what we're reading here says, my Lord being old also. That's an example that she referenced her husband. You see that thing? Now watch this. Give me the book. Give me the book of Genesis, okay? You know what? Not, don't, don't give me Genesis. Give me First Peter 3. I don't want to go somewhere else. Let me just stick with this one. First Peter 3, read verse 6. First Peter, chapter 3, verse 6. Come on. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling you know him Lord. Hold on. Start at verse 5. Hmm. Start at verse 5. I'm going to show you something with this. Watch this. Come on. First Peter, chapter 3, verse 5. Go ahead. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves, being in subjection unto their own husbands. They were in subjection unto their own husbands. So it's letting you know about our foremothers of the past. They were in subjection to their own husbands. Why? Because they understood the mission. They understood what was at stake. They understood who the enemy is. They understood all of that. Even during the 60s, when you look at during the time of, um, you know, our forefathers and foremothers that were fighting the white supremacy uh, apartheid government, guess what? Our sisters, our mothers, they were 100% behind our forefathers. There's even a book called, um, I think, Ap Apartheid something. I have the book. And in there, you see, it shows you our foremothers, you understand, during the 60s in South Africa. They are holding signs saying we are behind our leadership all the way. Talking about who? Talking about the black man. They were wearing dresses. They had their head covered. They had their heads covered. And they were saying we are 100, where it says they were, we are behind our leadership 100% all the way. Something like that. I'm paraphrasing it, but that's what they said. They were revolutionary women. They supported, they, because they understood, they knew who the enemy was. Today, our sisters don't know who the enemy is. There's confusion. The black man also, he don't know who the enemy is. Look at that boy. Barakiman, Nkanta Lux or something. He's always wearing military uniform wherever he's going and so forth. He don't know who the enemy is. Because I see now they are going around in, in Soweto and all that. What are they doing? They are saying, no, the foreigners, so-called, our brothers and sisters from the Congo, Nigeria, Ghana, Guinea, okay, Zimbabwe, so on and so forth. He says, if they don't have papers, they must go back. But they don't confront the, the enemy. They don't confront the white man because he's the enemy. They don't confront the Arab man because they are the enemy. They don't confront the Chinese men, you understand, that are flooding our communities and all of that. They don't approach them, though, but they're approaching their own people. Just wicked and dumb as hell. They just dumb as hell. You understand? So now, hmm, First Peter 3, verse 6. Read that. First Peter chapter 3, verse 6. Go ahead. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, mm -hmm. whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well, and are not afraid with any amazement. 
You see what he's saying? He says, even as Sarah obeyed Abraham. So that's what we read in Genesis 18, verse 12. Obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You see, she reverenced her husband. She supported him. And because she was, she supported our forefather Abraham 100%. Watch what happens when it was wartime, when our forefather Abraham was in distress. Watch what happens. Get Genesis 14. Let me show you when our forefather Abraham was in distress, when those uh, former Mesopotamian kings, they took their spoils, they were fighting with the five, the five Amorite kings and so forth, and they won over the five kings with their armies and so forth. Our forefather Abraham realized, he was told that Lot, his nephew, was also taken. That was, that was when he was in distress, right? Get Genesis 14. Genesis chapter 14, read verse 11. Let's start there. Genesis chapter 14, verse 11. Come on. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and mm -hmm. all their victuals and went their way. Let's talk about the four kings now. Come on. And they took Lot, Abram's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. So not only did they take the, vid, the, the food and all the supplies and so forth of the five kings that they overthrew, then they, 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 they put to flight some of them. It says they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son. You understand? So now, not only did they take him, but they took his what? They took his goods and departed. Remember, Lot was rich. You understand? Go ahead. Watch this. And there came one that had escaped. And told mm -hmm. Abram the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamri, the Amorite, brother Amor. of Eshcol and brother of Aner. And these were confederate with Abram. And these were confederate, confederate with Abram. So they were Abraham's allies. Okay, go ahead. Watch this. Read. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, Stop right he here. armed. Hold on, wait, wait, wait. When Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, that's when he was in distress. But if he was married to a wicked woman, guess what? She was going to what? She was just going to discourage him. She was not going to say, so you also go there, you also gonna get killed. Nye, 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 nye. So why are you going out there? Why are you going out there to go and retreat? You see how many they are? How do you think you're gonna survive? Do you really think you're gonna get him back with such a few people that you've got. That's the mindset. That's exactly what's going to happen. Because remember, is the four kings with their hosts. You understand? Is the four kings with their hundreds of thousands of uh, military men, men of valor. So now Abraham is going out there with 318 men. If our foremother Sarah was a black ashy devil, you think... She was not going to discourage him before he suit up. He had to put his war suit on and go to war. Of course, this war was going to turn out different. But because she supported him, she was a revolutionary woman. Guess what? Read that thing again. I want you men to pay attention. Sisters as well. Read what you got. Genesis chapter 14, verse 14. Mm -hmm. And when Abram heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, mm -hmm. 380, and pursued them unto death. You see that thing right there? It says he armed his trained servants. So you really think also he was going to be allowed to train his servants? No. So why you, well, they're going to, they, they, because you know the sisters, they be reading this book, The Secret. It says now you are preparing for war. So you see, you are attracting war to you now. The secret. That's what they're going to bring to you. You understand? So come. They're going to be talking about you garbage like that. So, but our forefather Abraham, he trained, his servants was well trained by him. So much so that if war popped off, guess what they did? He armed them and said, okay, it's war time. Let's go and deal with this thing. So that's what we're reading here. Go ahead. Read that again, verse 14. Genesis chapter 14, verse 14. Mm -hmm. And when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto death. 
and pursue them unto Dan. So he's giving you the location of where Dan would be in, in the north. You understand? Because Dan wasn't born at this point. Israel was not even born at this point. Okay. Keep reading. Go ahead. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants by night, mm -hmm. and smote them and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. Go ahead. And he brought back all the goods and also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. You see that? So he brought the nation with him back. So imagine our forefather Abraham did not have a revolutionary wife. So you sisters, you have a role to play and it's an important role too. Don't think your role is not important. It is important. You understand? So I wanted to show you that so you can see the, the, difference, the difference it makes when you marry a revolutionary wife and the difference when you don't marry a revolutionary wife. How things, how bad things can turn out. You understand? Because I'll give an example when you don't marry a revolutionary wife. Watch this. Give me the book of, um, give me Second Kings. Yeah. Okay. Let me show you what happens when you're not married to a revolutionary wife. Get first, no, no, not second. First Kings 22. First Kings 22 verse 17. I'm going to show you something. Watch this. First Kings. Chapter 22, verse 17. Go ahead. And he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills mm -hmm. and sheep that have not a shepherd. Ray. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. You see what he's saying? He says, this Makai is prophesying. He said, listen, um, and he said, I saw all Israel scattered upon the hills as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return every man to his house in peace. Next verse. Watch this. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, did I not tell thee that he would prophesy no good concerning me, but evil? Now, the king of Israel is who? Jump down to verse 19. Let's see who the king of Israel is here. First Kings chapter 22, verse 19. Mm-hmm. And he said, Hear thou therefore the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne, and all the host of heaven standing by him on his right hand and on his left. Go ahead. And the Lord said, Who shall persuade Ahab that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead? And one said on this manner, and another said on that manner. So the king of Israel is, you guessed it, Ahab. Ahab was the king. So now, when you don't have a revolutionary wife, guess what? Well, guess the type of wife you've got? Jezebel. Because Jezebel rules, rules through men. You understand? You, she doesn't come to the front, but she'll use a man in the front. Though. But she's pulling the strings the whole time. That's the mindset of Jezebel. So what we're reading here is, if Jezebel is in the background, Israel is in trouble. Because Israel was in trouble, that's what Micaiah is prophesying. When Jezebel is pulling strings in the background, Israel is a sheep that have no shepherd. You understand? And guess what? You will get overthrown. Because Jezebel is sitting in the background, just controlling things. You understand? So, and things are not, things are going to go bad. because. What we're reading here is, he's letting you know that if Ahab goes to war, it's a wrap. They are going to be overthrown by the Assyrians, by the Syrian army. Not the Assyrians, but the Syrians. So it's going to be disastrous. That's the point. You understand? So, but our forefather Abraham was successful in his conquest. Why? Because she, he had a revolutionary wife behind supporting him our foremother, Sarah, she reverenced him. That's why he was able to continue and push like that. You understand? Now watch this. I wanted to give you those examples so you can really see the importance of marrying the right sister. 
You understand? Also, marrying the right brother. If a brother is not about his nation, you really have problems. If the brother does not care about his nation, he only married you because he married you for last. Guess what? He's not going to care about the nation. You are going to be frustrated as a wife because he's not going to care about the nation of Israel. That's the point. Now watch this. Um, go back to Titus now. Titus 2, read verse 4 now. Titus 2, verse 4. Let's read that. Okay, come on. Titus chapter 2, verse 4. Mm -hmm. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to Wait. love their husbands, to love their children. Read that again, verse 4. Titus chapter 2, verse 4. Mm -hmm. That they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. So the day is the age women in verse 3, that they may teach the young women to be sober. Because how would they be able to teach the young women to be sober? Because they themselves were taught to be sober by who? Their husbands, the leadership, their father. You see that thing? So that's why they'll be able to teach these young women to be sober because they will what? They will show a righteous example to these young women. Okay? To love their husbands, to love their children. Now watch this. Get that in First Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. First Timothy 5. Verse 13. Let's read that real quick. Because it says that they may teach the young women to be sober. Because if they don't teach the young women to be sober, guess what's going to happen? Read that. First Timothy 5, verse 13. Hmm? First Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. Come on. And with all, they learn to be idle, mm -hmm. wandering about from house to house. Really? And not only idle, but tetlers also and busy bodies, mm -hmm. speaking things which they ought not. You see that thing? Is it because if they are not being, if these young women, that's talk about your teenagers, you understand? Your teenagers that are now sexually active, they are on TikTok, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, WhatsApp, all these social media platforms that what? That they are uploading their naked pictures where they are twerking and all that. Guess what? If the aged women, they are not there to teach them and to set the right example for them. That's exactly what they're going to do. They learn to be idle. Guess what? Once they are idle, they're going to do evil things. And like what's going on right now. Look at the, the statistics of teenage pregnancy. Look at the statistics. The, look at that. It's staggering. Okay. Teenage pregnancy, abortion. You see that thing? Um, kids, having kids. Hmm? STDs, HIV, the statistics are high. I mean, during the corona, during the corona period, when it was, when it was, you know, it first, it first hit, guess what? When you look at the statistics from the Department of Education, you look at, they say 23,000 young girls, 10 year old to 14 year old, guess what? They had babies, they committed uh, abortions. You see that thing? They fell pregnant. And this is only Jovek. It does not talk about, I'm not talking about the other provinces, but this is just Jovek alone. This is within, this, this is within a, a short period of time. That, that's what happened. 10 years old. Between 10 years old and 14 years old. That's what these young girls are doing. These teenagers. We see them in the complex. We see them in the classes. We see them, when in the classes, we see them all over. They are wearing mini skirts. They are wearing bum shorts. They are showing their cleavage. Ten year olds, they are showing their cleavage. Ten year olds, they are showing their thighs. Ten year old, eleven year old, they talk about how to lie on their back. What the hell do they know about that? Because why the aged women are not around to set the right example for them. That's why now they following the examples. Abu Kanimbau, Abu Peltusi, Abu Babes, what do more? That's, these are the, that's the examples they follow. Those women don't get married. They move from man to man, jump from rod to rod. That's what can you buy, who pays what to women, all that. They're not setting the right example. So what makes you think that these young girls will, will, will turn out any different? They will not. Now, read that thing again. First Timothy 5 verse 13. Come on. First Timothy 
chapter 5, verse 13. Go ahead. And with all, they learn to be idle, mm -hmm. wandering about from house to house. They wander and about from house to house. They wander about from house to house. Today, unali boyfriend ko 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 Alex. Nini ni unali boyfriend ko ko ah ko two ko Eboni. Nini ni unali girlfriend ko California. It's always changing, and that's what we see. That's why now people like YouTube, they are young, yeah, they are creating, they are making money out of our people's ignorance. You understand? Because they are angry about, but but they become jolly. I get they are they, they are jolly, but they become jolly. So Jolo is making money for people that are saying, oh, wait a minute. These people, they are just jolling around. They are cheating on one another. They lie one to another. They are not applying the commandments. So we're going to create um, we're gonna create a TV program out of this. We are Jola 99. Yeah. You see that? Now there's another guy that is on YouTube now. What is he doing? He's, he's getting the, the couples to exchange phones. That's what he's doing. I don't know if anybody has seen that. Anybody seen that? Yes, sir. Hello? Yes, sir. I've seen it, sir. Okay. Oh, praise. Yeah, because I've seen that as well. You understand? Now, read that again, verse 13. First Timothy 5, verse 13. Come on. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 13. Mm -hmm. And with all, they learn to be idle, wandering about from house to house. And not only idle, but tetlers also and busy bodies. You see that? Speaking things. He says busy bodies. He says, he says they learn to be idle. But he says, and not only idle. They are not only idle because when they are idle, they are doing evil. Then he says, um, but tetlers also and busy bodies. Because, listen, the only busyness that a child, these teenage girls must have is they must be joined to their mother's hip to learn how to cook, how to clean, how to wash, how to even bath themselves, how to put lotion on, how to take care of where they stay, where they live, how to fold the clothes. How, you know, you know, they must learn all these things. That's the things they must learn. They must keep them busy with house chores, with chores in the house. So that by the time the day is done, she's exhausted, meaning what? She's out. When she goes to sleep, she just passes out. That's what the Lord is saying. That's what the Most High God is saying right there. Keep reading. Go ahead. But tetlers also in busy bodies, speaking mm -hmm. things which they ought not. Speaking things which they ought not. Because the things that they are speaking now which they ought not is what? They talk about sex. They talk about boyfriends. They talk about, um, yeah, they talk about, um, they talk about how, uh, no, I kiss the boy. I kiss the girl. That's, the, that's what they talk about. They smoke, they drink. You understand? They, they know how to take selfies by showing their behinds now. That's what they're doing. They now even know how to put on makeup. You understand? They know how to shake their bums when they're a 10 year old, 11 year old. That's what we see. We see them in the suburbs, we see them in the cassis. Guess what? It's all the same. Because as a people, we are destroyed. Why? Because we rejected God's commandments, the greatest knowledge that God ever gave to us, the 12 tribes of Israel. We rejected it. That's why now as a nation, we have broken family homes. Why? Because the laws of God are not being kept. T kids are not being taught God's laws. You understand? That's why now they are busy bodies now. 10-year-old know how to lie on their back, but she don't even know how to wash herself yet. She don't know how to wash her behind. She's still unhygienic. She's still smelly. She don't know how to wash between her legs. She don't know how to do that. But she know how to lie on her back. I mean, what the hell is this? That's the times we're living in now. And the government is not helping. They are, they are pushing comprehensive sex education where they are teaching girls and teenage boys and teenage girls from under, under, what, under nine years, under 10 years old, and they are under 10 years old. They are teaching them comprehensive sex education. You understand? So now there's a curriculum. There's a module at the schools now, primary, starting go primary, under seven. Now their government says they're going to be introducing male and female condoms under 10 year old 
in the in the primary schools. What is that? Hmm? And they're gonna show them how men and what, what happens when a man and woman have sex. What do they have to know about that? That's something that they will find out when they get married. But guess what? Because they are showing them in the classrooms now, they show them, they even have, they even have 3D toys that they can use to show this is how, what happens when a man sleeps with a woman. That's the things they show now at the schools. So what do you think they're gonna talk about when school is out? What do you think they're gonna do? You think they're not gonna try, they're not gonna um, practice, put that in practice? They will, they absolutely will. So we have a lot of work to do. Understand that. Read on, verse 14, come on. First Timothy chapter five, verse 14. Go ahead. I will therefore that the younger women marry. The younger women. Children. Hold on. The younger women must marry. So these young women, which is what? The women that are at a, a, a marriageable age, 20 years and up, those are young women. Is that the young women must marry. Notice it didn't say young women must have sex first. And then you have, you have sex with as many men as you possibly can. And then once the coochie is tired, now you're thinking about getting married. That's not what the Bible is saying. The Lord is saying the younger women must marry. That's the first thing. Marriage first. Now let's see the next step. Go ahead. Bear children. That's when you can have kids. So you marry before you carry. You understand? Read. Guide the house. They must take care of the house. And where did they learn? These young women, where did they learn to take care of the house from? Their mothers. Because their mothers must teach them how to take care of the house. That's the job. You understand? Because if they, because now they don't know how, they don't know how to cook, but they know how to twerk. They know how to twerk. They know how to shake their bums. They know how to wear mini skirts, but she cannot cook. You see that? She cannot clean. She don't know how to wash dishes. She cannot even cook water. She can't do nothing. You understand? Ray? Really? Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Because now the things that these young women, these young girls speak, listen, listen, the conversations, we don't even talk about that stuff, but they do. Why? Because they are too idle. You understand? We see them. We see, you know, I see how, um, whether it's in the suburbs, whether it's in the cases, they just, the parents, they leave children by themselves. You see children by themselves the whole day. Where's the parent? You don't see the parent around. The children are there by themselves doing evil because the parent is lazy to educate their own children. So they just leave them out the house. Mama regular bolo, mama regular toy. Who say, okay, go to the pool, go to the this. Just run around the house that the, the yard just making noise. The child don't know how to do nothing. You don't know how to wash himself. You don't know how to bath. You don't know how to fold clothes. You don't know how to do nothing. But the parent is right there. They don't give a damn about their kids. We see it all the time. You understand? So go back to where it was at. Titus 2. Okay, Titus 2 and verse 4 again. Titus chapter 2, verse 4. You know what? Hold on. You know I got carried away. Because this topic really gets to me. Watch this. Give me second marker B7. Because remember it says they must teach the young women to be sober. So this goes into children, right? It goes into children. So children. So that goes into what? The young men also. The, the children. Because I get their kids. Whether it's a boy or a girl. The mother, they are the one that's supposed to groom them. And get to a level where the father takes over. And then the father now will take them to the next level. Now watch this. Give me second marker B7, verse 27. Now, this is our foremother during the time of the Greeks. You understand? She had seven sons. Okay. Watch this. Get second marker B7, verse 1. Let's read that. Second Maccabees, chapter 7, verse 1. Go ahead. It came to pass also that seven brethren with their mother were taken mm -hmm. and compelled by the king against the law to taste swine's flesh 
and were tormented with scourges and whips. So now you see, it's a common thing where they keep forcing us to eat pork, unclean food. You sit in the classes now, you see go spa. Now, when you go to spa, you understand 90% of the meat, meaning the majority, I wouldn't say 90%, but the majority of the meat when you go to spa, you go to shop right, it's pork. You go to boxer, it's pork. You go to roots, it's pork. It just pork everywhere. You understand? That's how now they are pushing it now. They are not forcing it down your throat, but they're making sure when you go to the shops, that's what you see the most. That when you go to the meat section, you'll find pork, pork, pork. Okay, now jump down to verse 26. Go ahead. Second Maccabees, chapter 7, verse 26. And Wait. when he had exhorted her with many words, she mm. promised him that she would counsel her son. Come on. But she, bowing herself toward him, laughing the cruel tyrant to scorn, spake in her country language on this manner. Oh, mm -hmm. my son, have pity upon me that bear thee nine months in my womb, and gave thee suck three years, and right. nourished thee, and brought thee up unto this age, and endured the troubles of education. What did she do? And endured the troubles of education. She endured the troubles of education. Seven, seven sons she had. And remember, each son is different. They are not the same. So each son requires, diff, the, the requires they learn different. So she needed to understand that each, each son was different. They are not all the same. So she had to tailor the way she taught them differently based on how they receive instruction and information. Some are visual, some are musical, some are, they require pictures, some require you to write things down and so forth. Some require to sing things out, they sing it out, they remember it quicker so on and so forth. So she had to figure all that out. So that's a huge job. So we should not be seeing kids running around all over the place, but the parent is not there. But here it says, this is our foremother now, is that she endured the troubles of education because it's a painful process to educate kids. It's not an easy job. You understand? That's why you see today parents, they just give up the ghost. They give up the ghost, they give the children they give the children, they buy them PlayStations, they buy them the tablets, the little smartphones, so they, and they buy data. You know, I had a sister, this is years ago. This sister, I used to go to school with her, okay? And this one day, she told me, she's like, listen, she, got, she had a son. And she was like, listen, you know, my son is always using my phone, is always downloading games on my phone, and she eats my data because she's always playing all the. And I sat there and listened to it. I'm like, hold on a second. How do you allow your son to actually take your phone and download games? Where, where, where are you when at this point? What are you doing? You just sit there. She says, ah, there's nothing I can do because, you know, like in, if there's no data, she, he cries. I'm like, you see, that's the problem. So that's what you see. But this formula right here, she, uh, she, she, what? she went through it. She taught, she taught her sons, her seven sons, okay? So that's why it says to love their children. The young women must be sober. You understand? These older, me, the, the age women, they teach the young women. You understand? They teach the young women. So now think about it like this. If it's, if it's, if, because she had to teach sons yet. So likewise, the young women also, their job is to teach these young women. You understand? How to cook, how to clean, take care of the house. You understand? They are preparing them for what? To be a woman. Then they are also preparing them for what? To be a wife, not to be a girlfriend. You understand? That's what they are doing. These older women, that's their job, to do that. You understand? Okay, now watch this. Now let's go back. Let's go back to First Timothy. I'm in Titus. Go to Titus now. Read Titus 2, verse 4 again. Read that again. Titus chapter 2, verse 4. Mm -hmm. That they may teach the young women to be sober, right. to love their husbands, to love their children. You see that? 
So they may teach the young women to be sober, to love their husbands. How are the aged women gonna teach these young women to love their husbands? The only way they're gonna know how to do that is because they are taught how to love a man. Because only a man can teach you how to love a man. A man will teach a woman how to love a man because men know men. That's why our forefather Adam, when the Lord made him, after Adam had everything, he got wisdom, he got a job, yeah, he was given a job, he was given a place to stay and so forth. When Eve came, Eve was to Eve didn't know nothing. You understand? Our foremother Eve, she didn't know anything. Adam had to teach everything to Eve. So likewise, what we read in the Titus does the same thing. These aged women, they learned how they were, they were able to teach the young women to be sober because they were taught themselves, they themselves were taught to be sober. Then it says to love their husbands because they themselves, these aged women, were taught by their husbands how to love their husbands. You see that? To love their children. Who taught them that? The husband did that. The father did that. The leadership does that. That's, that's how we build our nation. So the man must be nation-minded. The sister also must be nation-minded because the nation that the sister's mind must be on is what? The nation that the husband is building. Understand that thing. Okay, go ahead. Verse 5. Wait. To be discreet. Mm -hmm. Chase. Keep us at home. Good. Obedient to their own husbands. That the word of God be not blasphemed. You see what he's saying? He says they must be, they must be taught to have discretion. They must be chased, meaning disciplined. Okay? Keep us at home. They must be able to know how to deal with the house. Watch this. Give me Sarah 26, verse 16. These aged women, they knew, they learned from their husbands how to take care of the house. Now, when it's time for them to now teach these young women to do it, they know how to do it already. So it's easy for them because they have experience. Okay? Sarah 26, verse 16. Let's see. You understand? A, a mind, the mind of a wife that is well instructed, where her mindset would be. Watch this. Okay, come on. Ecclesiastes chapter 26, verse 16. Mm -hmm. As the sun, when it arises in the high heaven, so is the beauty of a good wife in the ordering of her house. You see that thing? It says, as the sun, when it arises in the high heaven, meaning sunrise. Sunrise is beautiful to look upon. You understand? It says, likewise, so is the beauty of a good wife. He didn't just say beauty of a wife. It says the beauty of a good wife in the ordering of her house. So the beauty of a good wife is how she orders her house. Not how, how well she can twerk. Not how, 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 how many curves she's got. You understand? Not how much cleavage she can show. No. It says what? So is the beauty of a good wife in the ordering of her house. The beauty of a woman is through is seen through how she orders her house, not how much she can twerk. You understand? Not how much she can run a big black mouth. No, not how much she can curse her husband out. Mm -mm. How she orders her house. You understand? Because she's ordering the house that the husband taught her how to order it. Guess what? When she teaches the young women, she'll know how to teach them because she's got experience. That's the job. That's, that's the order right there. You understand? We've lost that. Because when you go to the Bundus, you see our mothers and our grandmothers, they still know how to do that. Not the women today. They don't know how to do that. She'll tell you, me, I don't cook. You drop that sister like a bad habit. Because guess what? That means you're going to be ordering from McDonald's. You're going to be ordering from um, parking Debonairs. You'll be ordering from chicken licking and KFC and all that because she don't know how to cook. Whenever she cooks, there's death in the pot. Where are you going to get the money for that? Because those things are expensive. Eating out is not cheap. But guess what? You brothers, when you prove, you sisters, when you are being proved, you, you need to understand, you need, you need to know these things. 
You understand? You need to understand these things, okay? Now, watch this. Go back. Go back to Titus, okay? Go back to Titus 2. Read verse 5 again. Titus chapter 2, verse 5. Mm -hmm. To be discreet, chaste, keep us at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. It says, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Because when women are not obedient to their husbands, that means the word of God is being blasphemed because that's out of order according to God. You understand? That's out of order according to the most high. So now you what the, the, the now the situation you have is in the house, there's going to be division in the house because the wife don't submit to the role that God gave. Whenever you have that type of situation, is because guess what? One, the wife does not believe that her role is to submit to the man. She believes that her role is to be equal or above the man. That's why when you look in the black community, the Israelite community, which is our nation, there's broken family homes. You understand? There's no marriage, but there's bumping and grinding. There's, there's sexual immorality going on. Why? Because the laws of God are not being taught. We don't honor marriage. We commit adultery fornication, you know, all of that because marriage is not being honored. So how are we going to build a nation like that when marriage is not honored? Watch this. Get that in Hebrews 13 real quick. Okay. Hebrews 13 verse 4. Watch this. Read that. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4. Mm -hmm. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So God is letting you know, it says marriage is honorable. That in itself is letting, that's a heavy statement right there. The reason why you see as a nation now, we are not honored as a nation is because we don't honor marriage. You men understand that? Yes, sir. Let me repeat myself in case I started. The reason why you see as a nation, we are not honored by all these other nations, the Chinese, the Arabs, white people and so forth is because we don't honor marriage because marriage is a foundation for a strong marriage that is set up according to God's laws is a foundation for a strong nation because we don't honor marriage as a nation we are not honored understand that read again verse 4 come on Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 read Marriage is honorable in all, and mm -hmm. the bed undefined. Come on. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. So now we are, we are, we are, we as a nation, we have fallen into the categories of whoremongers and adulterers. And that's why you see there's so much whoredom in the land. That's God's judgment. There's so much brokenness, broken family homes. That's God's judgment. Single parent household, God's judgment. Teenage pregnancy and abortion and STDs, HIV, God's judgment. Young men and older men filling up the jails, the prisons, God's judgment. Why? Because marriage is not honored. Children out of order, they disrespect their parents. Because why? Marriage is not honored. Because in order for them, the children to learn how to be good kids, they must see the example of the parents. Because of what? Because of that strong marriage. If they don't have that, guess what? they're going to grow up to be what? Delinquents, and they're going to be disobedient. They are going to be dishonorable. Understand that thing. Read it again, verse 4. I want this verse to hit, to hit that nabi. Okay, read it again. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 4. Mm -hmm. Marriage is honorable in all, and well, the bed undefined. Come on. But whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. But homongers and adulterers, God will judge. So we need to honor marriage. And the way we do it, this is how we do it. Get Exodus 22, 16. No, no, Exodus 20, verse 14. This is how we honor marriage, okay? Exodus chapter 20, verse 14. Come on. 
Thou shalt not commit adultery. That's how we don't, that's how we honor marriage. We honor marriage by not committing adultery. Because when we commit adultery, we are dishonoring marriage. You understand? Sex outside of the covenant of marriage. You understand? So now, because we, we don't honor marriage, that's why you see there's so much whoredom and adultery in the black community. Why? Because we don't honor marriage. You understand? We don't honor marriage because the nations don't call us. They, 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 when the nations speak about us, give me that in Deuteronomy 4, verse 5 and 6. The nations don't speak about us like this. They don't. Okay, watch this. Deuteronomy 4, verse 5. Read that. Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 5. Come on. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that mm -hmm. ye should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. So now the Lord is teaching, Moses is telling us, listen, I've taught you statutes and judgments as he was commanded by the Most High. Next verse. Watch this. Come on. Keep therefore and do them. You see, hold on. It says keep therefore and do them. That's the key right there to success. Application. It says apply the statutes and the judgments. Okay, go ahead. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. Stop right there. It says the statutes and the judgments, meaning the commandments, guess what? The law, statutes, and commandments that I've, I'm teaching you and you are, I'm commanding you to do them as according to the law, it says, is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations. So when we keep God's commandments, guess what? That's our wisdom and our understanding in the sight of these nations. Because the nations, when they, when they look at us as a nation, they don't respect us. They don't. Because think about it, right? When you look at the way the image of the black man in the sight of the nations is not a good image. They look at us as thugs, drug dealers. We lie, we cheat, we stop, we, we steal, we rob, we murder. That's the image that they, that's the image of the black man that the nations see. Now look at the black woman. The image of the black woman according to the nations is what? She's loud, she's stubborn, she's uncontrollable. She's good for twerking and showing a cleavage and wearing mini skirts and bum shorts and leggings showing a camel's toe. You see that? That's the image. So the nations don't call us wise and understanding people. The nations don't call us that. They do not. You understand? Ray. We shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So when they, the nation see us applying the laws of God, this is what they're going to say. It says, surely this great nation is, is a wise and understanding people. Right now, the nations don't say that. Why? Because we don't honor God's laws, neither do we honor Mary. So as a nation, we are dishonored among these nations. We are a reproach unto them. You understand? Because we left the laws of God that, that made us special, the laws of God that gave us honor in the sight of these nations. The nations respected us. You understand? Because when you read, give me that in Wisdom of Solomon. Let me show you. No, no. Sirach. Because I want to show you that, that when we kept God's commandments, listen, we were in our glory, in our element that the nations came to King Solomon to hear of his wisdom and take that wisdom back to their own countries. Watch this. Sirach 47, verse 13. This is during the time of King Solomon's reign. Watch this. Come on. Ecclesiastes, chapter 47, verse 13. Go ahead. Solomon reigned in a peaceable time and was mm -hmm. honored. Come on. For God made all quiet round about him, that he might build a house in his name and prepare his sanctuary forever. Go ahead. How wise was thou in thy youth and as the flood filled with understanding. So King Solomon was given the greatest knowledge on earth during his time. Go ahead. Thy soul covered the whole earth mm. and, and thou fillest it with dark parables. 
You see what he's saying? He says, your soul covered the whole earth and thou fillest it with dark parables. That was Solomon's wisdom. Go ahead. Thy name went far unto the islands mm. and for thy peace that was beloved. You see, it says thy name, meaning King Solomon's name, he says it went far unto the islands. Okay, watch this. Go ahead. The countries marveled at thee for thy songs and mm -hmm. proverbs and parables and interpretations. You see that part right there? It says the countries marveled at thee for thy songs. That goes into Song of Solomon and Proverbs and parables. That's wisdom of Solomon and interpretations. Wisdom of Solomon. So what we're reading here says the countries marveled. How did they marvel? Because they will travel from far to hear Solomon's wisdom. An example of that is the Queen of Sheba, that Egyptian, that Ethiopian woman. She traveled from far to come and hear Solomon's wisdom. That's when we were in our glory. You understand? Right now, if you were to ask these other nations about the, the, the which, which, which women on the earth, they are loud, they are stubborn, you understand? They, they dress immodestly, they show their behinds, their cleavage, their bums and all that. Let's say you ask an Indian woman, ask her that question. She's not going to say Indian women. You ask an Indian man, he's not going to say Indian women. He's, he's not gonna say he's not gonna, he's gonna say black women. Ask any other race, ask them about the black woman, ask them about the black man. You're not gonna get a good report, you're gonna get a negative report. Why? Because we're not keeping the commandments of the Lord. So we have to think about the nation. We have to be nation-minded, not just about you, but your whole nation. You understand? So now in these last days, the Lord said, okay, I'm going to raise you up now. I'm going to revive you in the lens of your captivity. That's what the Lord is doing right now. He's reviving us. You understand? Reviving us to go to return back to our nationality. Okay, watch this. Um, give me, I'm going to show you something, right? Watch this. Give me the book. Give me the book of um, Nehemiah 2. Give me Nehemiah 2. Because, because we, you know what, get 2nd Ezra 5, 17. Let's just get that as well. 2nd Ezra 5, verse 17. I'm going to use that as well. Okay, let's start there. 2nd Ezra 5, verse 17. Watch this. 2nd Ezra, chapter 5, verse 17. Mm -hmm. Knowest thou not that Israel is committed unto thee in the land of their captivity? He says, do you not know that Israel is committed unto thee in the lands of their captivity? Don't you know that you men? The sisters, you, you, you've got a very important job. Don't think your job is minute. No, it is important because your job is to educate and teach the children. You understand? At the command of leadership. So now it says, do you not know that Israel is committed unto thee in the lands of their captivity? Is committed unto who? The men. The men, because the Lord calls the men first. So the nation of Israel, we, guess what? The Lord says he has committed the 12 tribes of Israel unto us, the men, to teach them and guide them and teach them God's laws. You understand? To apply it. That's how we, we deal with the problems in our communities and so forth. Drug dealing, they need the laws of God. Love your neighbor as yourself. You understand? Stop selling drugs to your brother. Stop killing your own brother. Stop prostituting, prostituting your sister. Stop being a pimp. Keep the laws of God. That's how we build our communities. Okay? Give me Nehemiah 2 verse 10. Nehemiah 2 verse 10. Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 10. Go ahead. When Sanballat the Horonite and Tobiah the seventh, the Ammonite heard of it, it grieved them exceedingly that there was come a man to seek the welfare of the children of Israel. So now, as the Lord is waking us, Israel is reviving us in these last days. It says what? The nations are grieved because what? It says there was come a man to come and seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Who is that man? That's you, brothers. When we go to the streets to wake out to teach our people, guess what? The nations are grieved by this. 
Don't get it twisted. The nations are grieved, meaning what? They are afraid of what's going on. So because the nations are afraid, guess what? You think the nations are, are just going to sit there and do nothing? You think the nations are going to sit there and take it then and not going to be able to, to, to make plans to stop this truth? Of course, they are going to do it. You understand? Give me that in Revelation 11, verse 12. Revelation chapter 11, verse 12. The nations are not afraid when we get up, when we toy toy, we march. You understand? The nations are not afraid of that. That does not put fear on the nations. That does not grieve the nation. It doesn't. I'm going to prove that. Get that in Revelation 11 and verse 12. Watch this. Go ahead. Revelation chapter 11, verse 12. Come on. And they heard a great voice from heaven saying unto them, Come up Wait. hither. And they ascended up to heaven in a cloud, and their enemies beheld them. Okay, read verse 11. Read Revelation 11, verse 11. I think that's what I want. Yeah, read that. Verse 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 11. Mm -hmm. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them. And they stood upon their feet, and mm -hmm. great fear fell upon them which saw them. You see what the Bible is saying? It says, once the Lord revives us, you understand? It says, it says the spirit of life from God entered into them. Not politics entered into them. Not Christianity entered into them. Mm -mm. It says the spirit of life from God entered into them. Meaning what? God's commandments to bring to our remembrance our identity. Who we are, where we come from. What are we supposed to do to come out of the conditions we're in? So our nation can be exalted above all nations on earth as it was in the days of old. Okay? It says, we stood upon our feet and great fear fell upon them We saw them. Where are they going to see us? On the streets. Where are they going to see us? On the street corners when we are teaching, that's one. Another way they're going to see us is what? They're going to see us wearing fringes on our clothes. They're going to see the men growing their beards. They're going to see sisters wearing long dresses covering their heads, dressing modestly not celebrating Christmas, New Year, Mother's Day, Father's Day, Valentine's Day, none of that garbage. Guess what? That's what's going to bring fear to the nations. Not to enjoying, mm -mm. getting married, you see that? Teaching our children and raising them up according to the laws of God, that will put fear in the nation. That's what the Lord is saying. The nations are not grieved when we, we march and toy toy and destroy property and set buildings on fire. The nation, that doesn't grieve nobody. Keeping us God's commandments well. Read it again, verse 11. Revelation chapter 11, verse 11. Mm -hmm. And after three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them, and they stood up, and they stood upon their feet, and great fear fell upon them which saw them. That's the job. This is the job of the black man and the black woman. But this is going into the black man standing upon his feet taking his rightful place as the, head of the, as the head of the house, as the leader of the community, as the gods of the earth. Guess what? The sisters will support the men. Their, their role is to do what? Teach the children. You understand? Make sure their house is in order so that they, the, the young girls, when they grow up, they also will maintain the same standard that God has set up as they, as they were taught by their parents. Watch this. Give me the book of Joshua. Okay, give me Joshua 11 verse 1. Because during the time of Joshua's conquest, when we're conquering the land of Canaan, guess what? That was physical, but the spirit of the Lord was upon them. But I want, let me show you this day. It's the same thing. The only difference is that we don't go out there with guns and so forth, with knives. Mm -mm, we go with the Bible. You understand? The nations are going to be consumed with the spirit of the Lord's mouth. Watch this. Give me Joshua 11. Read verse 1. Joshua chapter 11, verse 1. Mm -hmm. And it came to pass when Jabin, king of Hazor, had heard those things, that he sent to Jobab, king of Madon, and to the king of Shimron, and to the king of Akshab. Akshab. So now what's going on here is that these kings, they are joining forces against our forefather Joshua. They are joining forces because they heard that, you understand, we discomfited, obviously, we destroyed Jericho. 
Okay, we destroyed the king of AI. You understand? We destroyed though the city of AI because it was greater. Like we, if we read chapter ten, chapter ten, verse one, the the inhabitants of Gibeon they came. They wanted to what to make league with us so they can be under our protection. So they became our allies and so forth. So these other Amorite kings, they were like, hell no. We're going to wage war. We're going to come together. You understand? We're going to fight against Joshua for doing this. What was Joshua doing? We were conquering lands and kicking people out the land that was rightfully ours, that God promised to our forefather Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Understand? I'm going to show you how this is going to tie in with what we are doing this day. Keep reading. Verse 2. Come on. And to the kings that were on the north of the mountains and of the plains south of Chinaroth and in the valley and mm -hmm. in the borders of Dor on the west. Read. And to the Canaanite on the east and on the west and to the Amorite and the Hittite and the Perizzite and the Jebusite in the mountains and to the, and to the Hephite and the Hermon in the land of Mizpeh. So now what's going on here they are, they are gathering themselves together. Remember what we read in Nehemiah. It says, for it grieved, it grieved them that there was come a man to come and seek the welfare of the children of Israel. Because there, we did it back then during the time of Joshua and Moses, you understand, David and so forth. Today we are doing it again, but on a spiritual level before the Lord returns and wreak havoc on this earth. Watch this. Keep going. Go ahead. And they went out. They and all they are host with them, much people, even as the sand that is upon the seashore in multitude, with horses and chariots, very many. So now they are, they are bringing their host, their army. So now their armies, because they're getting all these different kings, they also coming with armies against us. Go ahead. And when all these kings were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. You see what they did? It says, and when all these things were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Merom. What I'm not showing you is that when, when we, we stand up upon our feet with the spirit of Christ, we keep God's commandments, we fight for our people, our nation, we pull them, we pull the strongholds in the minds of our people, that Jesus is a black man, he's not white with, with blonde hair, pink eyes and, and yellow hair. Listen, the nations come together to fight against us. Back then, it was physical. You see how they're doing it now? Watch this. Give me the book of 1 Esdras 572. This is how they are fighting against us now in these last days. This is how the nations are fighting. So the, 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 the fight has not, has not changed. The mindset of the nations hasn't changed, okay? Watch this, First Ezra, chapter 5, verse 72. Come on. First Ezra, chapter 5, verse 72. Go ahead. But the heathen of the land lying heavy upon the inhabitants of Judea and holding them straight, hindered their building. You see what he's saying? He says, laying heavy upon the inhabitants of Judea. Are they not laying heavy upon us now? Yes, they are. Called captivity, oppression, racism, so on and so forth. You understand? Economic. Economically, they are oppressing us. You understand? When it comes to land, they are oppressing us because they pushed us in the ghettos. We live in mesh boxes and so forth. Yes. They are oppressing us on every level. Go ahead. It says, and holding them straight. Straight means what? We are, we are basically packed like rats where we stay. That's what he's saying. In that they are building. Now they want to stop us from building our nation up. Let me show you how they're doing it now in these last days. Go ahead. And by their secret plots and popular persuasions and commotions. Their secret plots, that's the media today. You understand? And popular persuasion. The secret plots meaning what? They do it behind closed doors. Their popular persuasions is their social media, their news networks, their TV programs, their radio stations. That's their popular persuasion because... They are able to, uh, to persuade the, pop, the general populace against us. Because when we go out and teach that Jesus is black, they say you are teaching hate. When we teach that salvation is only for the so-called black man, 
the Native American Indian men, the Mexican men, so-called, they say we are teaching hate. We are teaching racism. But when they taught us why Jesus, we didn't say that. When they taught us that God is white, the angels are white, they are the chosen people of God, that was hate. That was racism. That was hate speech. We teach in the Bible as it is written. But that's not how they look at it. Why? Because they've got media on their side. You understand? Go ahead. They hindered the, the finishing of the building all the time that King Cyrus lived. Stop right there. Is, you see that part, that last part, it says, and commotions. You see that? Meaning commotions, meaning what? They are able to gather the people together against us. I'm going to give an example. Give me the book of Acts. They didn't want bringing this out. I'm trying to show you sisters and you brothers, especially the sisters, the war that the black man has out there. The amount of war that we have to fight. You understand? We have a lot of opposition against us. That's why we need you sisters to see the bigger picture. Okay? Give me the book of Acts. I'm going to show you what they did to the apostles when they were teaching. Okay, Acts chapter 17. Watch this. Acts chapter 17, verse 5. Because, you know what? Read verse 2 so we understand. And you know what? Start of verse 1. Because the reason why I want verse 1 is because of what? There's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a location in there where our people were scattered. Watch this. Read that. Come on. Acts. Chapter 17, verse 1. Mm -hmm. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica. Where was the synagogue of the Jews? You see where they went? Thessalonica. That's where our forefathers were scattered, in Thessalonica. That's why we have the book of Thessalonians. Okay, go ahead. And Paul, as his manner was, went in unto them, and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures. You see that? Three Sabbath days, we were reasoning, we, they reasoned with them out of the scriptures. That's what we do every Sabbath. We reasoning with our people out of God's laws. Go ahead. Opening and alleging that Christ must needs have suffered and risen again from the dead, and that this Jesus, whom I preach unto you, is Christ. Next verse. Watch this. And some of them believed mm -hmm. and consorted with Paul and Silas and of the right. devout Greeks and a great multitude and of the chief women, not a few. So now he says, there are those that believe and consorted with Paul and Silas, meaning what? They say, listen, we, we, we believe what you're teaching. Now we want to join. That's how they consorted with Paul and Silas. And you understand? They believe. Not, not just the men, but the women as well. They believe what was coming out, right? Watch this. Go ahead. But the Jews which believed not. But the moved Jews which believed. Hold on. But the Jews which believed not. Because remember, the nations, remember what we read in First Esther. The nation are, are using popular persuasion, which is the media, to do what? To push a, a narrative out there that that what we teach is hate speech and whatnot and whatnot. And our people that are fighting with the enemy, they also believe that. So now you have heathens that hate was coming out. Then you have, you have heathen-minded Israelites, our people that hate what we teach. And what we teach is not what's in our mind, it's what's written in the book, okay? But I'm gonna deal with that commotion part. Keep reading, go ahead. But the Jews which believe not moved with envy. You see that? Our people that don't believe, the Lord is telling you the reason behind their lack of belief. Envy. Okay, go ahead. Took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort mm -hmm. and gathered a company and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason and sought to bring them out to the people. You see what happened? It says they, they were moved with envy. They took unto them certain rude fellows of the base of soul. These were what? These were black ashy demons. And gathered a company, that's the commotion, and set all the city on an uproar and assaulted the house of Jason. Meaning what? They put hands on them and sought to bring them out to the people so that the mob can do what? Can stamp on them. That's what they were doing to the apostles. It happened back then, 
it will happen this day. Understand why? Because the Jews that believed not that were moved with envy. Because the root of envy is hatred. You understand? So guess what? That popular persuasion is not just for the other nation because the other nations know already that we is. The problem is they are persuading our people that we are, are the enemy because our people don't know who the real enemy is. They forgot. You understand? So that's why it's easy for them to turn against us. But I'm showing you a lot of opposition that the black man now is we're rising up, the Israelite man has to deal with out there. So we need the sisters to support the troops. You understand? Watch this. Give me, go back to Joshua, okay? Go back to Joshua chapter 11. Joshua 11 verse 5 again. Joshua chapter 11 verse 5. Mm -hmm. And when all these kings were met together, they came and pitched together at the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. So now, they, I mean, they wage, they wage war with us. Next verse, go ahead. And the Lord said unto Joshua, be not afraid because of them. For tomorrow, about this time, will I deliver them up all slain before Israel. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt hold their house, Thou shalt hold their horses and burn their chariots with fire. He says, we shall hold their horses and burn their chariots with fire. Go ahead, watch this. So Joshua came and all the people of war with him against them by the waters of Merom suddenly, and they fell upon them. Meaning what? Against these, these five, these kings that joined forces to go to war with us. But the Lord says, don't be afraid. They are going to be delivered into your hands. Go ahead. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Israel, who smote them and chased them unto great Zidon and mm -hmm. unto Misrephoth Maim and unto the valley of Mizpeh eastward. And they smote them until they left them none remaining. And he said, I meaning we put everybody to death. Go ahead. And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. Stop right there. He is, is said, Joshua did what? And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. Now that's very important right there. It says Joshua did unto them, meaning the nations that came against us, as the Lord bade him. Because today, remember, we are in captivity. But the Lord says, I'm going to revive you, right? Give me 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4. We're coming back here to Joshua 11 verse 9. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 4. Watch this. Start of his three. Second, Cor Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3. Come on. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. Because Joshua went to war. He gathered all the men of war and they went to what? To, 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 put, to put to death the nations that plotted against us. Here the Lord is saying, listen, for though we walk in the flesh, meaning what? Our flesh, it says we do not war after the flesh. Meaning what? We don't use our fists or guns or knives and all that to fight this war. You understand? But the same thing that he told Joshua to do back then is the same thing that he's telling us to do in these last days. Go ahead. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, mm -hmm. but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Now he's telling us the weapon that we must use for our warfare. Because we are at war. We are at war. We are at war. We are going out there to fight for the minds of our people. You understand? So we go from place to place, different places to teach our people. Why are we doing that? Because we are at war. And our the weapon that we use for our warfare is this Bible. The Bible is the most powerful weapon on earth. When we apply the laws of God, no nation can stand before us. Understand that thing. And when we go out there to war, he says what? To the pulling down of strongholds. The strongholds in the minds of our people is what? Why Jesus? Why Jesus is a stronghold? Because why Jesus is not in the Bible. Christmas is a stronghold. Women wearing pants, men wearing dresses, that's a stronghold. Mjolo, that's a stronghold in the minds of our people. Teenage pregnancy, you understand? That's a stronghold. 
Young men in gangs, stronghold in the minds of our people. Because why? Because they don't keep the commandments of the Lord. And when we go out there, they don't want to receive it. Those that do be the Lord's will, guess what? Those are those, those the ones that believe, they are the ones that the Lord, the Most High God, will pull that, those strongholds in their mind. That's the war that we're in. And guess what? We must do as the Lord has commanded us, just like he commanded Joshua when he was fighting against those kings that conspired against us. You understand? Keep going. That's fine. Go ahead. Casting down imaginations and mm. every high thing that exalted itself against the knowledge of God. You see that? And so this thing is a, is, a, is a spiritual thing because it says what? Casting down imagination. Something that you imagine takes place in your head. You understand? Strongholds. The things that you imagine, somebody else put them in your head and you acting account according to the images that somebody else has put in your head. They put your head, they put those images through the media, newspaper, social media, you understand, smartphones, whatever the case may be. Okay, go ahead. And bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You see that thing? We, want, we must pull out the strongholds in the, with the Bible, the strongholds in the minds of our people. So go back to Joshua 11, verse 9. You understand? And the way, you know what? Get Luke 14, 23. The same way Joshua was commanded, we're doing the same thing this day in the spirit of Christ. Although this time is a spiritual warfare. Watch this. Read that. Luke chapter 14, verse 23. Come on. And the Lord said unto the servant, mm. go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in that my house may be filled. So now, now we go out to the street corners we set up camp, we teach our people. The weapon of our warfare is this Bible. Okay, now go back. Joshua 11 verse 9 again. Joshua chapter 11 verse 9. Mm -hmm. And Joshua did unto them as the Lord bade him. Read. He hold their horses and burnt their chariots with fire. Because these are their weapons of war. Their weapons of war back then, it says what? Their horses, because they would carry the weaponry and so forth, and the men of war on them chariots. And he says, what? Burn their chariots with fire. Meaning destroy their weaponry, the things that they trust upon when they go to war. Guess what? The weapons of our warfare now is the Bible. The weapons of our enemies is what? The media. You understand? They are the Christmas pagan customs, birthdays, Mother's Day, Father's Day, women in pants, 50-50, feminism. LGBTQ, you understand? Um, gender fluid. You, you see all of that? Eating whatever you want. You don't have to get married. You can be a woman if you want. If you're a man, you can be a woman. They're going to provide surgery. No, there's signs for that. You can be a man if you want. Look at Caitlyn Jenner. Now they call him, they, they call, they call him something else now. Caitlyn Jenner now is, I don't know what, what he calls himself now. He is a she now. Apparently. Now, guess what? That's their weapon of war. It's spiritual. You brothers and sisters understand that? So the same way where we went to war, they went to, they waged war against us. The Lord said, go out there and cut everybody. You understand? With the edge of the sword. Today, the edge of the sword is the Bible. Because they also have their weapons of war, which is everything that I just mentioned. Now jump down to verse 14. Come on. Joshua chapter 11, verse 14. Bring. And all the spoil of these cities and the cattle, the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword until they had destroyed them. Neither left they any to breathe. You see that thing? Neither left they any to breathe. So all these cities, we were spoiling them. How are we spoiling them today? How are we doing that? Let me show you how we are spoiling them. Give me that in 2nd Ezra chapter 11. 2nd Ezra 11 verse 37. I'm going to show you how we are spoiling them now. Because from city to city, that's where we go and teach the gospel, right? We travel, we go and teach the gospel. We go to different locations in the, in the continent to, I mean, in the country to teach our people. Watch this. 
Second Ezra, chapter 11, verse 37. Second Ezra, chapter 11, verse 37. Go ahead. And I beheld, and lo, as it were a roaring lion chased out of the wood. And mm -hmm. I saw that he sent out a man's voice unto the eagle and said. So now Ezra is saying, listen, I'm seeing as it were a roaring lion. You see, I see a roaring lion. You understand? Lion chased out of the wood. It says, as though it was chased out of the wood. Meaning it was what? It was running. You understand? So it says, and so that he sent out a man's voice unto the eagle and said, so who's the eagle today? That's America. You understand? That's America, Babylon the Great. That's the eagle. Go ahead. Hear thou, I will talk with thee, and the highest shall say unto thee. So now the lion with the man's voice will talk with the eagle. You understand? How are we going to talk? Who's the lion? He says, the lion will come out of the wood. Will, will, what? He says, a man's voice will be given to this lion. Watch this. Give me the book, because this is twofold. He's first going into Christ, but he's also going into us in these last days before the Lord returns. Watch this. Get that in Deuteronomy, okay? Deuteronomy 33, verse 7. Okay, watch this. Because how this is how we are going to spoil them. Okay. Deuteronomy 33, verse 7. This is how we are going to spoil the, the strongholds, the imaginations that they want, the strongholds in the minds of our people that have been put in there by our enemies that hate and despise us. Deuteronomy 33, verse 7. Watch this. Read what you got. Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 7. Mm -hmm. And this is the blessing of Judah. And he Come said, on. Hear, Lord, the voice of Judah. The and what? bring him the voice of Judah. Remember, it says, he saw a roaring lion and a man's voice was given unto it. So it says, and this is the blessing of Judah. And he said, hear, Lord, the voice of Judah. Okay, go ahead. And bring him unto his people. Mm -hmm. Let his hands be sufficient for him and be thou an help to him from his enemies. You see that part right there? And he says, bring Judah to his own people. So when we go to teach our people, we go to the Cassis, we go to Mamilodi, we go to Pretoria, we go to Soweto, all these different places go and teach. Guess what? That's where the Israelites are. The Lord says, I'm going to send you to where my people are. You're going to teach them. But watch this. He says, let his hands be sufficient for him in terms of what? Gathering resources. You understand to be able to bring out the history and teach our people and connect the, the history and the condition of our people with the Bible. Then he says, and be thou an help to him from his enemies. That's how we're going to spoil them now in these last days because our weapon of war is this Bible. We are spoiling, we are spoiling the weapon of war, the weapons of war that our enemies are using against the minds of our people. Because they teach them philosophies that they made up. They teach them politics, religions, and so forth. That's the strongholds in the minds of our people. So the way we're going to spoil those strongholds, we do what? We teach our people God's laws. We are breaking the spell. Because our people are under spell. You understand? So that's what we're reading here in Deuteronomy 3, verse 7. Now, go back to Joshua. Okay, Joshua chapter 11, verse 14 again. Joshua, chapter 11, verse 14. Right. And all the spoil of these cities and the cattle, the children of Israel took for a prey unto themselves. But every man they smote with the edge of the sword until mm -hmm. they had destroyed them. Neither left they any to breathe. You see that thing? It says, we didn't leave anybody to breathe. Meaning what? Because our job is to do what? Is to chop down all the strongholds that have been put in the minds of our people. Okay, go ahead. As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Now that's some heavy stuff right there. He did what? Read that part again. That last part again. He left nothing undone 
of all that the Lord commanded Moses. You see that thing? So he was following after the footsteps of who? Moses. Moses left nothing undone. Likewise, Joshua did not leave anything undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. That's some beautiful stuff right there. That Moses, Joshua was following after the example of who? Moses. You understand? He was following after the example of our forefather Moses. Now, jump down to verse, read verse 18. Okay, watch this. Joshua chapter 11, verse 18. Mm -hmm. Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. You see that thing? It says Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. Right now, the kings of the earth, what are they doing? They've gathered together against us and against the Lord. Watch this. Give me the book of Psalms. Okay, give me Psalms 2. I'm going to show you something here. It happened during the time of King David. It happened during, it's happening. It happened during the time of Joshua Moses. Guess what? It's happening today in these last days. Watch this. David is prophesying me. Read that. Psalms 2 verse 1. Psalm chapter 2 verse 1. Go ahead. Why do the hidden rage and the people imagine a vain thing? He says, why do the hidden rage and the people imagine a vain thing? The people is talking about our people. The heathen, that's obvious. Go ahead. The kings of the earth set themselves and so the rulers. The kings of the earth you see set that themselves. Part right there? The kings, the kings, the kings of the earth, plural. The kings of the earth set themselves. You see what you, the same, that's the same wording that we're reading in Joshua. When it says Joshua made war a long time with all those kings. Those kings of the earth during his time. Now, David is prophesying about what? The kings of the earth in our time in these last days. Read that part again, verse 2. Psalm chapter 2, verse 2. Mm -hmm. The kings of the earth set themselves. And the rulers take counsel, take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying. You see that? It says, and against the Lord and against his anointed, meaning against Christ. So what is happening is, what happened back then with Joshua and them is the same thing that is happening to us today. The same nations that were fighting back then, the, is, the nations are gathered together again this, in these last days. Against who? Against the people of God and against God and his son, Jesus the Christ, and against this too. But they are not going to succeed. The reason why I'm bringing this out, I'm trying to show you men and you sisters the war that we're up against. You understand? When it comes to nation building, these are the things that we need to think about all the time. You understand? Go back to Joshua. Okay, Joshua chapter 11, verse 19 now. Joshua chapter 11, verse 19. Mm -hmm. There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel. Mm. Save the Hivites, the inhabitants of Gibeon, all other they took in battle. You see what he's saying? There was not a city that made peace with the children of Israel. Is there any city that is making peace with us today? No. It's us against the whole earth. It happened back then, it's happening today. Keep reading, verse 20. Come on. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts. You see that? Meaning it's of the Lord to harden their hearts. That's why when we push this truth out, it seems like the nations are dull of hearing. You understand? But it's of the Lord. Just like when the Lord sent Moses and Aaron unto Pharaoh, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. That's the same thing today. That's why they keep pushing. They keep put, they, there's a media blackout on the Israelites. All over the earth, there's a media blackout. You put a video out, YouTube puts, pulls it down because they don't like what's in it. You understand? Read that verse 20 again. Joshua chapter 11, verse 20. Mm -hmm. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle. Mm -hmm that he might destroy them utterly and that they might have no favor 
but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. You see that the Lord, the, the Mosa is teaching us that the reason why I'm doing this is because when I destroy them, everybody's going to know. Because it says, if the Lord hardened their hearts, you understand that they should come against Israel in battle. Why is the Lord doing that? The Mosa is hardening the, the, the minds of the heathens to come against us in battle. Why is he doing that? Watch this. I'm going to show you why. Give me the book of Judges. Okay. This is the reason why the Lord is doing it. Okay. Get Judges 3 verse 1. Watch this. Um, you know what? Get Judges 2. Judges chapter 2 and verse, uh, verse 21. Judges 2, 21. The Mosai is doing this. Why? I'm going to show you right now. Read that. Judges chapter 2, verse 21. Mm -hmm. I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations which Joshua left when he died. Okay, because Joshua left some nations because it was of the law. Go ahead. That through them I may prove Israel whether they will keep the way of the Lord to walk therein as their fathers did keep it or not. Go ahead. Therefore, the Lord left those nations without driving them out hastily. Neither delivered he th them into the hand of Joshua. He didn't deliver these Hamites into the hand of Joshua, right? Get George, Judges 3 now, verse 1. Watch this. Come on. Judges chapter 3, verse 1. Mm -hmm. Now these are the nations which the Lord left to prove Israel by them. Even as many of Israel as had not known all the wars of Canaan. So now the Lord is saying, listen, I'm going to leave these nations among you so that what I can prove you. He's proving us for what? For war. Spiritual war that we're in right now. Go ahead. Come on. Only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war. To teach them the what? To teach them war. To teach them what? To teach them war. To teach them war. To teach them war. The Lord is saying, the reason why I'm leaving these nations among you is to teach you war, how to fight. So how do we fight now? We fight with the Bible. We don't fight with our fists and all that when we go out there. No, we fight with the Holy Bible. Precept upon precept, line upon line, slaying demons in broad daylight. Mm. And at night, because that's when they come out. Now, what we're reading here, the Lord is saying, I'm going to leave these nations among you to teach you war. The Mosai is hiding in their hearts so that the nations can fight against us. The Lord says, I'm doing that to teach you how to fight because you forgot how to fight. You used to know how to fight because I taught you how to fight. Now you forgot. I'm going to use these nations to do what? To put pressure on you for you to go into this Bible and learn it and apply it and know how to war. That's why the Lord is doing this thing. You understand? Now, keep reading. Go ahead. At the least, such as before, knew nothing thereof. You see that thing? Now watch this. Mm. Jump down to verse 4. Judges, chapter 3, verse 4. Come on. And they were to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would hearken unto the commandments of the Lord which he commanded their fathers by the hand of Moses. It's the most I don't do anything by mistake. Watch this. Give me that in uh, Exodus 15. You understand? Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. Watch this. No, 15, verse 2. Yeah, yeah, 15, verse 3. That's what I want right there. Get that. Exodus chapter 15, verse 3. Mm -hmm. The Lord is a man of war. Go ahead. The Lord is his name. The, the Lord is a man of war. The most high God likes a good fight. He is a man of war. Understand that. So if the most high God is a man of war, what is Israel? We are the army of the Lord. We also supposed to be what? Men of war. About our nation. The reason why is that I'm leaving all these nations around about you to be pressing your buttons and pushing your buttons I'm teaching you to for you to learn how to war. Go into this Bible and get your mind right. As these nations are testing you and, and trying to do evil to you, you're going to go into the Bible to, to know how to fight. 
That's what he's saying right there. Now we have war on our hands. So imagine, look at the war that we're in and you are married to a black Ashi demon who's always running a big black mouth. Listen, we don't got time for that. That's why you brothers, when you prove, make sure you get a righteous sister. You sisters, when you prove, because sisters, they also have work to do. They also have their office, Titus 2 verse 3 down to verse 5. They also have a job to do. Imagine you are married to a non-revolutionary man. Listen, I mean, look at, look at, I'm, I'll give an example, right? a carnal example of the world. Look at Mandela versus Winnie Mandela. Winnie Mandela was a revolutionary woman. She was revolutionary. Mandela was revolutionary when, before he went into prison. When he came out, Esau had put that uh, brainwashing juice on his head. You understand? He forgot how to fight. But our foremother, Winnie Mandela, she kept the fire going until they said, no, no, you need to separate from this woman. You understand? But I'm showing you here is, look at the life of our foremother, Winnie Mandela, and our forefather, um, Mandela. Before he went into prison, I mean, he was on fire. Came out, went into prison, came out. They cooked him, he became all nations now, rainbow nation. Winnie Mandela was not on that tip. She was still about the deliverance of his, her people. You see that? So I want you men and women to see this thing. Okay. Now go back to Joshua. Joshua chapter 11 verse 20 again. Joshua chapter 11 verse 20. Mm -hmm. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts that they should come against Israel in battle mm -hmm. that he might destroy them utterly and that they might have no favor but that he might destroy them as the Lord commanded Moses. You see that? So the reason why the Lord did this, the reason why the Lord did this back then, and he's still doing it today, is to prove Israel by using this nation. To, to prove you say, okay, now you're under pressure. Now there's all this opposition and affliction against you. What you gonna do? You better go to the book of war and learn how to fight. That's what the Lord is doing. And guess what? Get Judges, I mean, get Joshua 10, Joshua 10, verse 22. We, you understand? When we, were, when we were in our element, you understand? Obeying, keeping God's commandments, trusting in the Lord. Here's what happened to our enemies when we came on the sea. Read that. Joshua 10, verse 22. Watch this. Joshua, chapter 10, verse 22. This is now Joshua going to war with the five Amorite kings. Okay, because they were upset that the Gibeon had made peace with us. You understand? And so they say, okay, they wanted to wait. They, they came together to wage war with Gibeon. And, but Joshua, he went there and he, he slaughtered them. You understand? And now there were these five kings that were locked in a cave. Well, they were still dealing with the conquest to deal with the other kings, you know, to slaughter them. They locked some of them in a cave. And when we were done, we went to the cave to deal with them, you know, properly. Read what you got. Joshua 10, 22. Come on. Joshua chapter 10, verse 22. Mm -hmm. Then said Joshua, open the mouth of the cave and bring out those five kings unto me out of the cave. Right. And they did so and brought forth those five kings unto him out of the cave. The king of Jerusalem the king of Hebron, the king of Jamuth, the king of Lashish, and the king of Eglon. Go ahead. And it came to pass, when they brought out those kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war, which went with him, come mm -hmm. near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. Mm. And they came come here, on and put their feet upon the necks of them. You see what Joshua did? He said, okay, this is how you deal with your enemies. He says, put your foot on your enemy's neck. Hmm? Next verse. Go ahead. Watch this. And Joshua said unto them, fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye fight. You see that? 
is, is what you are doing right now, putting your foot on your enemy's neck, that's exactly how the Lord is going to do to all your enemies that fight against you. That's what's coming. Right now, what we're doing, we're reviving. The Lord is reviving us. We're going out there to wake up our people. We're fighting for the minds of our people. What the Lord will do, guess what? He will literally put his foot on our enemy's neck. And when the Lord is satisfied, he's going to send Israel out, the 144. Now we are no longer going to be uh, fishers. We are going to be hunters now. You see that thing? So that's where the hunting will come. Right now we are fishers. We are fishers of men. We are bringing Israel in and teaching them God's laws in the spirit of Christ. You understand? But what the most High God is showing us is that we put our trust in him. We fight according to what, how he commanded us. Just like he commanded Joshua to war, that's the same thing he's doing with us this day. So there's no room. There's, there's no, you can't give up on this. Giving up is not an option. You understand? Watch this. Get that in Matthew 24, because this is what Christ said. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Watch this. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Mm -hmm. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. You see that? But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So we must endure unto the end. I want you brothers to see this thing. When we go out there to war, we go to different places to teach the gospel. What do you think we're doing? We guess what? We are rescuing our people. We are rescuing the minds of our people, our, the minds of our brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, uncles and aunties, sons and daughters. That's what we're doing. The same way when our forefathers, during the time of Joshua, during the time of King David, we went to wage war to keep to what? We, we were conquering lands. That's what we're doing right now, but on the spiritual level. We are at war. I need you men to understand that. Read that thing again, verse 13. Matthew chapter 24, verse 13. Come on. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. The same shall be saved. Next verse, come on. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. The end is going to come when the gospel has been taught to our people wherever we are scattered all over the earth. You understand? We might not be able to reach all Israel. You understand? But guess what? The majority of Israel that the Lord wants us to reach, we will definitely reach them. And they will hear this gospel. They will believe and apply what is it. You understand? So we can go back home. And with that, I'm going to end the class right there. All praises to the Lord. Let's break bread in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Okay? So don't call the verse. Just read. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed to bread, and when he had given thanks, he break it and said, Take it. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup, when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye, as often as ye drink it, in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread, and drink this cup, ye to show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread, and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily, shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. In the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. 